Well, it's a bit warm, but not as warm as it's been, nor will it endure quite as it did several weeks ago. In the beauty of this place, in the hope of Christ, I welcome you all to Westminster Presbyterian Church, where the tower, thank God, still stands. To those of you at home via YouTube or your computer, the very best to you as well. And by the Spirit of God, our hearts and lives and hopes and dreams are conjoined. We are a part of the great fellowship of faith, the company of saints. Welcome again to this place that is safe, a place where all can be whom you are called to be, allowed to be, encouraged to be, by the very love of God, our Creator. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. Turning to your bulletins or looking on your television screen, join with me in the prayer of confession and hope, saying together, Holy God, forever our Redeemer and our Guide, be merciful to us, we pray. Bless our efforts to live well. Correct our errors of thought and deed. Strengthen our resolve to live for Christ, that we might be the salt of the earth 
and the light of the world. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Dear friends, you belong to God. Now for some that might sound uncomfortable, <laughs> but it shouldn't be and it mustn't be. To belong to God is to belong to the very origin of your life. To belong to God is to belong to the very source from whence you came, a source that gave you life with love, breathed into you the very spirit of God. It's a good thing to belong to God, especially when we, when we are cognizant of our errors of way, shall I say, and our many failings, which sometimes mount up higher than we would like. But the point of it is nothing can separate us from the love of God secured for us in Christ. To God you belong. To God you're important. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are forgiven, and even now, you are being made new. And so we sing, glory be to God. Please be seated. Several announcements. First of all, I will call your attention to a note that is already included in the bulletin um, where the sermon of the day is noted. We have a guest with us, the Reverend Allie Lee. Allie, why don't you stand up there? And Actually, Allie and I were out on the uh, sidewalk this morning. Uh, remain standing, please. You're not getting out of this quite so easily. Uh, Allie and I were out on the sidewalk this morning, and she and I were both waving at the cars today as they were coming by, and we had a good time. But Allie Lee is the stated clerk of our presbytery, and she has kindly consented to, uh, to preach this day. You might wonder why. Well, you've had me now for almost six months. We had Harlan Redman a few months ago, and this is to give you a break from me. And uh, Allie, we're absolutely, utterly de delighted to have you here at Westminster. Thank you. We will hear from you in a moment. Huh? So to keep Allie in our prayers, her family, of course, and our presbytery. Also in your bulletin this morning, there is a note and an envelope, a special offering, a, an offering of the, the year that is, the due date is next Sunday, actually. Uh, World Communion Sunday. But being good Presbyterians, we'll be happy to take your money anytime. So the Peace and Global Witness, a notable little handout here to remind us that we belong to a larger community of faith and only in the company of the larger community can we in fact accomplish even the greater things. Are there any other announcements this morning? There might be some personal concerns that need to be shared. We have a mic runner back there. If need be, any, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Any concerns that you would like to share this day? I was told yesterday or the day before by Norm, just I'm going to give you a little uh, heads up here that we start thinking about, is it the Thanksgiving gathering of bringing a variety? You'll hear more about that in the next week or so, but I just want to cue you up. Uh, 
if you're mindful of going to the grocery store and wanting to buy some provisions for Thanksgiving, buy a few additional provisions that you will be able to bring to the church here to help us feed people in our community. Uh, there's an announcement there. Helen, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it's a prayer request for my next door neighbor. Her husband passed away on Wednesday. And they, he was older. He was 79 and she's 80. They never had children, so her only support system is the extended relatives that live in the area that she has. Uh, so prayers for her and the family, because it's quite a loss. Yeah. Thank quite, you. Quite a loss, and thank God for that extended family at this point in time, and friends. Hello. Today is my son's birthday. So I wanted to tell everybody I brought a carrot cake so that we can celebrate his 45th young birthday. Well, I think... Thank you. Thank happy you. birthday is in order, wouldn't you agree? And he's a blessing because he was born at home. He's a homemade child. A homemade child. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Terrific. Imra, could you give us a little happy birthday? And nothing like being homemade. And by the way, speaking of homemade, uh, a prayer was answered this week. Ah, Phil and Deanna made it possible for us to have some Krispy Kreme donuts. But be sure to go back there and be mindful of me and waiting for me to get my donut, if you would be so kind. Any other announcements for the day? Let us pray. Eternal God, always our Father, forever our Mother, source of light, wellspring of love, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, all glory, laud, and honor to you, dear God, our praise, thanksgiving, and hope in the company of Christ, led by your Holy Spirit. We are your people in this place and for these times. We take up our cross of care and service with gratitude and with reluctance. Bless our gratitude and deepen it, we pray. Manage our reluctance that it not win the day. In such times, O oh God, times of uncertainty, Competing narratives, truth and lies commingled, power worshipped, glitz and glamour overwhelming our capacities to think. By your Holy Spirit, dear God, help us to maintain our balance, keep up our spiritual health and that of our bodies. Give to us, we pray, the discernment of the prophets, the passion of Moses, the wisdom of Solomon, and the focus of Christ. We pray for our food pantry, giving thanks that we can make a difference for people who are food insecure, for whom life is difficult and sometimes dangerous. We pray for our communities, O oh Lord, our government leaders, our schools and teachers, our police forces and firefighters, a host of people who protect and guide us, public servants for the common good. We pray for loved ones, dear God. Keep them safe in their comings and goings. Where there is illness, provide relief and healing. Where there is death, grant the comfort of Christ. Where there is despair, O oh God, Grant the light of hope. Where there is conflict and anger, give refreshment of spirit 
and a new determination to build a better world. Help us, O oh God, to fulfill our purpose in this life and for the life to come, to be servants of love, to create hope and peace, to seek what's best in the human story and that which is eternally true and forever good. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ah. <laughs> two birds, male, evidently, yeah, two male birds. competing against one another to catch the attention of the female. Well, that's an ageless story, I'm afraid. <laughs> anyway, you had me in suspense. I'm, I wonder who, who made it. <laughs> we'll see. Next week, maybe. Yeah, right, next week. <laughs> <laughs> Dear friends, the morning offering.
prayer of dedication, saying together, unto you, O God, our tithes and offerings, our minds and hearts, souls and bodies, all to you we give, for in such giving we find ourselves, in such giving the world is loved, in such giving we see the brightness of your glory, amen. Joining with me in the affirmation of faith, excerpts from the brief statement of faith, 1991, saying together, in life and death we belong to God, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ. We trust in God. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Respecting uh, whatever protocols, COVID protocols may be important to you, uh, Walk about or at least nod. Let one another know that you're here. Make some noise of greeting and blessing one another with your kindness. Hi, Allie. Pay no attention to us. I guess Imra, call it up. Anyway, thank you very much. I really, really like that piece.
Once again, turning to your bulletin, please join with me in the unison prayer of illumination, saying together, Eternal God, grant us your light that we might see, your spirit that we might hear, your love that we might understand, and so live for Christ in the welfare of the world. Amen. The first reading is Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6 and 14 through 16. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which you will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be not haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life.
Well, good morning. As Pastor Tom mentioned, my name is Allie Lee. I am the stated clerk for the Presbytery, and I know I don't look it, but I'm actually 38. I live, I'm actually one of your neighbors. I live just up the street uh, near Farnsworth Park with my husband and our three-year-old daughter. And it is always a joy to drive by on Sundays and see Pastor Tom waving as I'm headed to another place of worship to be reminded of the friendliness and the welcome of this community. So thank you for this joy that it is to be in worship with you all, to be together with you in Christ as sisters and brothers in our presbytery, to join with you in the work of loving our neighbors. So one of the Instagram accounts that I follow, yes, I'm a millennial, so I follow Instagram accounts, uh, asked this question and you, you check the box, yes or no. Do you ever look back on your pre-pandemic life and think, what was I thinking? Now this person is a parent educator and she is a mom of three who talks to other parents about how do you develop curiosity and creativity through play. Her question was because she was looking back at her pre-pandemic life thinking, what was that life? And was it really life, the busyness, the activities, everything that I was wrapped up in and round so, wound so tight around. How full was my time in the pre-pandemic time? And I had that same kind of questioning that I started thinking about after I read that Instagram post. How is it that you or I define what it means to have a life? What do we think is real life? not in the sense of what's real and fake, between the difference between fiction and nonfiction, but what is real life? What is full life? What is whole life? A gift of our scriptures is that we have these different accounts of people who have been asking these same kinds of questions for millennium. And it's different, it's presented to us in different ways. This morning we were able to hear poetry and a letter. So whether it's a parable, a history, a poem, or a letter, our ancestors have given us their insight into these questions. And as Pastor Tom has mentioned in his sermon series already the past two weeks, there's not a lot of answers sometimes. But even in the questioning, I think we find ourselves able to have a deeper sense of God's presence with us and through us. And that itself is a gift. The poem that we read from Psalm 91 is an invitation to reflect on God as our provider, our fortress. I chose this text because every time I look at the sanctuary, I think, that is a refuge place, a reminder of the big, expansive God who has called us and claimed us as God's own and where we find peace and restoration. What a beautiful reminder, just like the poetry of that psalm, that we are called and claimed by God and have a place to hide from the storms of this world. This morning, though, I want to focus more on the letter in 1 Timothy. Because in letters, especially in Paul's letters to Timothy, we're invited into an existing relationship and a, a warm and loving relationship. It's not like Paul's letters to some of the churches where you can tell that he's a little bit angry with them because goodness knows what exactly they've been up to, but he needs to correct them. With Timothy, we're invited into this mentor-mentee relationship. And I wonder, as you think about your mentor or mentors, what was that like? What was that relationship like for you? The person that came alongside you, maybe it was a high school teacher, maybe it was a school teacher, a youth leader, a pastor, maybe it was somebody in your first job who came alongside you and helped show you the way. Think about that person or those people. What was it about that relationship 
that brought you life and excitement? I asked my husband this question. He's a PhD student, so he has a mentor, or he actually has two mentors, and I said, Brian, what is it about your mentoring relationships that is, has helped you in this really long road of writing a dissertation? And he said, the mentors have helped me to see that I'm not alone in this work. The questions that I have are questions that they've had and thought deeply about. They're people that invited me in and said, what you're thinking, what you're doing matters. I'm interested in it. I want to know more and I want you to do well. What a wonderful gift those people are in our lives. The people that have walked this road before us that can walk it with us and remind us along the way that we are not alone. And that's what Paul is doing with Timothy. And he, in fact, uses this road analogy so many times throughout this passage to remind Timothy and those who are reading it after to stay on a particular road, the good road. And there's a certain quality of staying on that road that Paul wants to highlight. You see, he's concerned because he has observed there's a lack of contentment with what one has. Maybe it was Timothy, maybe it was somebody in Timothy's circle. Maybe it's just an observation that Paul's had after years of living on the earth, that it's hard to be content with what you have. And it's easy to fall into a temptation of looking for wealth to solve a problem that you aren't content with what you have. Seeking after riches, Paul says, can lead into temptations and traps, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. I just want to pause and say that A is really important. Sometimes when I've heard this passage growing up, I heard it being the love of money is the root of all evil as if loving money was the only thing that led to evil. Well, friends, I think we all can acknowledge there are many other things that lead to evil, but the love of money is certainly a root of that. When I was reading this passage in a new translation of the Bible that I have, this is called the First Nations Translation, and it's an indigenous translation of the Bible done by um, tribes from the Americas. I wanted to read to you what it is that Paul says about what we should be doing instead of pursuing wealth. The, they render it, but you who follow the great spirit, run away from these things, making possessions your aim, and pursue what is right, living in a sacred way, trusting, loving, never giving up, and walking softly in a humble way. Fight the good fight of trusting creator. Get a firm hold on the life of the world to come that never fades away, full of beauty and harmony. I love that. Walking softly in a humble way is their translation of gentleness. I'm sure that you already know that these lands are not lands that our ancestors inhabited, at least not mine. I am very much a Scottish Presbyterian. My last name, in fact, before I got married is Kirk, um, which is the Scottish word for church. But those that lived here before and those of you who are descended from them were the Tongva or Gabrielino tribes. And one of their scholars, Torres, said that the major reason that the Tongva or Gabrielinos thrived was that they had a relationship with the natural land based on a deep respect. There is reciprocity that is needed in any type of relationship we have, whether it's human or animal, planet, whatever. It's a give and take. And that's how my ancestors were able to survive on this land, not for a few hundred years, but for thousands of generations. Scholars think that Tongva or Gabrielino peoples had lived on this land in the Los Angeles basin for maybe 10,000 years. 
And there's something in this pursuit of wealth that I think maybe we've gotten wrong, where we have started to think since the Industrial Revolution that we are mechanisms in a big factory where we're producing products and we have to continually stay busy. But I think what the pandemic taught us was that there's a lot of need for rhythms that are slower, for working in the earth, for being with our families and our friends, that we suffer in isolation and that maybe we suffer in the fury and the frenetic energy of busyness. Even if we aren't intentionally trying to make ourselves millionaires, we still are caught up in this complex of becoming good producers of things. And in the church, good producers of good works. But I think there's something that we can learn from the Apostle Paul and from those who occupied this land about what it means to have real life or good life that there's reciprocity, that there is work that happens between us and the land, between us and each other, that takes time and a humble way of walking softly. As we reemerge from the pandemic, as you all consider what you are going to be as a community of faith going forward, I hope and my prayer for you is that you will have a deep, deep sense of what is real life, what it means to be faithful followers in this space, in this beautiful sanctuary and out on these grounds, what it means to love your neighbors here in Pasadena in the midst of all of the things that are happening, whether it's caring for our earth well, whether it's caring for the poor and the homeless who are living on our sidewalks, whether it's caring for your family and your friends well, that we are not wrapped up in a pursuit of something that isn't real, that's fleeting, that's going to fade away, but that we focus on things that will last, that are beautiful, and that bring us peace. The Apostle Paul says, stay on that good road that road that leads you to eternal life, this place that you hold fast to because it is, these are the things that will not pass away. Be whole, trust in God, your provider, and look ahead to a future where you are whole and at peace with one another and with God and with this earth. Life that is really life, according to Paul, is being content with what we have, pursuing godliness, faith, love, and endurance. In this way, we are storing up for ourselves and preparing ourselves for the life that is to come, where we won't be pursuing wealth because we will be living in the deep abundance of God. I want to close our time this morning with a prayer from Reverend Howard Thurman called, I Confess. I hope this will be your prayer as well today. The concern which I lay bare before God today is my concern for the life of the world in these troubled times. I confess my own inner confusion as I look upon the world. There is food for many. Many are hungry. There are clothes enough for all, and many are in rags. There is room enough for all, many are crowded. There are none who want war, preparations for conflict abound. I confess my own share in the ills of the times. I have shirked my own responsibilities as a citizen. I have not been wise in casting my ballot. I have left to others a real interest in making a public opinion worthy of democracy. I have been concerned with my own little job, my own little security, my own shelter, my own bread. I have not really cared about jobs for others, security for others, shelter for others, bread for others. I have not worked for peace. I want peace, 
but I have voted and worked for war. I have silenced my own voice that it may not be heard on the side of any cause, however right, if it meant running risks or damaging my own little reputation. Let thy light burn in me that I may, from this moment on, take effective steps within my own powers to live up to the light and courageously to pay for the kind of world I so deeply desire. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. spirit, who have rejoiced in God's work in this church and in and through you, will you go out this week trusting in God to be those who make peace, who work for justice, and who love your neighbors. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace and love.